Hey, Terry. Hey, Kevin. Hey. It looks like there's two of you in here, Terry. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I wonder. Uh, do you have, you're just using one computer? Yes. Okay. Do you want me to log off and come back in? Um, I mean, I feel like we should, oh, it's kind of picking up noise. So maybe we should Hello. get rid of it somehow. Hi, Michelle. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. We were just wondering, so do you see how there's two versions of Terry on here? Yes. Are you able to remove the one that just doesn't have video? Let's see. No. <laughs> oh, okay. You want me to go uh, out and try to come back in? You could try that. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me leave and I'll try to come back in. Okay. No worries. Oh, because that one's still there. Yeah. I feel like usually you can kick people out if you need to. Let me see. I can hide her. Nope. Wait, no, because then I hide everyone. Oh. How do we, this is so weird. I feel like usually you can kick people out. Um, is Heidi an attendee in the waiting room? Yes. It's okay. Just, yeah. Okay. Oh, no, it just creates two of know. you. Oh, wait. So I'm, why am I you? I'm so confused. <laughs> wait, that's, also, that's crazy. Um, I don't know what happened. Well, I'll just change my name. I'm like, Terry, what are you doing? And it's me. <laughs> um. So I'm actually um, not sharing video for this, Michelle, okay. just because I won't be speaking, but um, I'll be sharing my slides. Begin recording. And that's my page. Okay. All right. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Brian Jacobs. He is the CEO at Pan Open. Brian Jacobs is an education entrepreneur who has focused his efforts on making instructional content more accessible and pedagogically valuable for students, faculty, and academic institutions. During his time as both a student and professor of political philosophy at Cornell University, Brian saw firsthand how the high costs and dated nature of conventional textbooks adversely affect classroom learning. In 1999, Brian launched his first company, Academos, a web-based company that focused on new models of distributing physical and digital course material. After leading Academos for more than 12 years, Brian left his operating role to found PanOpen. Previously, Brian was visiting assistant professor in the Department of Government and visiting fellow at the Institute for German Cultural Studies was at Cornell University. He received fellowships from the Mellon Foundation, University of Göttingen, I hope I mentioned that, <laughs> and Yale University. He's currently a mentor in Star Ed EdTech Accelerator housed at the NYU EdTech Incubator. Brian earned a bachelor's degree with honors in English and political science at the State University of New York at Albany and a doctorate in political philosophy and social theory at Cornell University. Kevin Jeffries, Dr. Kevin Jeffries is a full-time faculty of Alvin Community College. He received his PhD in political science from the University of Houston in 2001. He has been on the full-time faculty of Alvin Community College since 1999, 
where he shared the government and economics department for a decade. He has presented papers at numerous conferences, hosted candidate forums, and served as an election judge, among other things. When not teaching, reading, or writing, he likes to road trip with his teenage boys and play his guitar. Dr. Terry Gilmer is a professor of government and political science at Midland College. She's a professor, sorry, uh, a position she has held since 1997. She's also the director of the honors program at the college and serves as the advisor of Phi Theta Kappa. She received her PhD from Texas Tech University. Currently, she serves as chair of the political science education section of the American Political Science Association, APSA, and was elected to the governing council of APSA in the summer of 2020. Through the years, she has presented numer numerous papers at professional conferences, primarily in the field of teaching and learning. At Midland College, she has received the Teaching Excellence Award, the highest award given by the college, and has been selected by the students as teachers of, Teacher of the Year three times. Um, so without much further ado, please begin. All right. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for that um, introduction. So we're going to move rapidly through this as we, we um, these are very brief sessions and we want to allow plenty of time for your questions. Um, so uh, again, my, my name is uh, Brian Jacobs and the founder of CEO of PanOpen, uh, which is a courseware company that provides the tools and services for faculty to adopt um, educational, uh, op open educational resources at, at scale. Uh, the combination of the tools and openly licensed content uh, improves equity of access uh, lowers by lowering costs. It also provides faculty with great control, as, as I hope you'll see through this discussion, uh, in ways that really are only possible with an open license. Um, our presentation today is focused on a project that we're working on with faculty from multiple colleges in Texas around OER-based course materials for Texas government. And joining me today are, are two of those contributors, Kevin Jeffries and Terry Gilmore. Um, so, uh, Texas government, as you may know, is a required course for all Texas college students. And uh, with the many challenges and changes unfolding each year in the, in the state capitol, uh, the, the multiplicity of perspectives and the areas of, of local interest, um, all of that makes it especially uh, interesting subject um, to for an open model, uh, not only for content development, but as, as we'll discuss in this session, for the purposes of iterating and localizing materials among um, the adopters of those materials. Um, so for today's session, I'd like to highlight uh, some of these advantages and then uh, ask uh, uh, Kevin and Terry to, to provide some color um, to these sort of uh, ba basic or general points uh, about these virtues. Um, so OER is typically introduced institutionally and promoted as a way of reducing costs to students, um, response to ever higher prices for commercial materials. Um, OER can now cover the same ground at little or no cost to students. Um, cost is and must be the starting point, the sin qua na, as it were, as a content choice. Um, it must dramatically lower costs, and the underlying resources must be free and open for anyone to use. So this shouldn't be, in other words, about putting up a walled garden around otherwise free content and then charging something for that. It's a crucial sort of launching point. Um, and today we'll talk about, starting from that launching point, the advantages that go beyond. Um, so the first I think to note is that open content facilitates a turn to a more inclusive narrative structure, uh, allowing the work to shift from a single voice and perspective to a multiplicity, from one that is fixed in a point in time 
to one that is dynamic and moving. Um, I would say within the open model, gone too is the dependency on the addition cycle, uh, awaiting the newest update from a commercial publisher, which may not account for the latest developments, let's say in the state capital, a new legislation or regulations, or at the local level uh, with regard to uh, local regulations or, or, or local matters of one sort or another. With the open model, whether as an author or as a doctor, the work is always in progress, adapting and iterating as the subject matter requires, not the internal business logic of a commercial publisher. Uh, in this way, OER can function similar to the way software development does uh, for cloud-based applications. So well-known example, Google search, right? Um, we don't wait for the new edition of Google search, uh, you know, to come out and, and we start using that. We're always already using the latest version of these cloud-based applications. And that's frankly what an open model OER lends itself to um, in the classroom with, with classroom and instructional materials. Um, and then the final point I'll make here, um, just as OER development is moving from centralized editorial process that mirror the world of commercial publishing, that's really how OER developed. Um, it is also breaking down the rigid distinction between producer and user, between author and reader. Um, so given the right tools and structure, faculty adopters can now look at OER not as a fixed commodity to which they need to adopt their courses, uh, but as a tool that can become an extension of the teaching itself, uh, reversing the adaptation process. It's not the course that's adapted to the, you know, the locked down content, but the courseware that is adapting to the, the teaching itself. It becomes, in other words, an extension of the teaching, an imprint, um, if you will, of the personality of the instructor who draws on topics of local interests that resonate best with his or her students. Um, so these are, these are big topics, of course, um, but to help make them more concrete and with particular examples and use cases, uh, I'd like to turn to Kevin and Terry for, for their experience so far in building out these resources. Uh, thank you. So uh, start with uh, Kevin. Uh, Kevin, you're on mute. Oh, there you go. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me, Brian? Yes, yes, okay, we can okay, hear you. Right. Thank you very much. And I do very much appreciate Brian for inviting me to be part of this uh, project. I find exceptionally, I've been invited to contribute three chapters, Texas State Constitution and the American Federal System, Financing State Government and Public Policy in Texas. And I can guarantee you that if you tell most students and even some faculty that you're focusing on finance, for example, their eyes will roll. Uh, and looking at the Constitution too, they'll say the same sort of thing, but really those are fascinating areas of exploration. And I think this platform allows for us to explain exactly what is fascinating and also what is relevant about those sorts of things in addition to public policy. And I've always felt that the way that we translate the information as government instructors barely scratches the surface of what is possible in an online environment, which I've always found a little bit um, puzzling. We're supposed to be smart people, we're supposed to be creative people, and so we should be able to uh, enhance what it is that we can in fact actually provide for our students by making it relevant, and it is relevant. Um, some people like to scream and yell about the quadratic equation. When am I going to use this? Well, then somebody might want to come in and say, well, when am I going to use the Texas Constitution or statutory law? You're doing it every day. You know, when am I going to have to deal with finance? Well, you do it every day when you're paying sales taxes. You know, you do it all the time. 
Uh, you're receiving benefits in all sorts of different ways. One of the things I like to do with my students too is when we discuss the community college environment, you're part of this. The community college um, uh, uh, district is a governing institution that finances education in a particular sort of way. So what I find innovative about this particular approach is that it opens itself up to this sort of thing. And by doing so, it helps students understand what sorts of things they can in fact actually do, which will expand their ability to be able to use these things for themselves, in addition to be able to understand the subject matter beyond just a box you have to uh, check in order to get your, get your degree. So everything that Brian had uh, focused on, the, the opportunity to provide this for economically disadvantaged students, the multiplicity of the voices that can be involved, uh, the fact that you don't have one static addition, uh, this can be a dynamic environment that can provide for uh, updates on a regular basis, as, for example, right now, the legislature is meeting in the state of Texas, and we, we need to revise things. I'm still putting a few things with the Constitution chapter, and one of the things I decided I need to do is to let's talk a little bit about some of the constitutional amendments that are being introduced right now within the state of Texas to make all of this stuff relevant. And uh, the final point that he made about localization. I really think that this is a, uh, a benefit of um, what we're doing here and what we can be able to provide for anybody who chooses to adopt this model, where we can focus, give, give enough opportunity for someone to take this information, this backbone, allow them to on what sorts of issues are going to be important in your particular area. What's important in El Paso is going to be different than what's important in Laredo or Brownsville or Amarillo or Fort Worth or Dallas or Houston or Port Arthur or whatever. It's a big state. And also help us in, uh, understand how those sorts of events that are happening in other states and localities around the nation uh, impact us. And those happen on a daily basis. So one of the uh, merits of this sort of approach and what we're finally, I think, hopefully taking advantage of um, is, is providing a, a venue, a platform, a format for individuals to be able to take advantage of that um, and do so in a way that is very pragmatic and very finite. I don't know if anyone who is watching gets frustrated sometimes when you look at material in a textbook and it's somewhat abstract. Uh, which is fine and all, but at some point you want to have some real information. For example, when you look at financing state governments, it's like, nice to know, let's get some real numbers. So, and there's documentation that's available for all of this. Anybody who's familiar with the fiscal size up that the Legislative Budget Board produces after every um, uh, legislative session in the state of Texas knows that this is a tremendous place where you can get actual information about the size of different programs in the state of Texas, where money is coming from, and there's so much that is there. Uh, one of the things that I'm trying to do, for example, in the uh, chapter on financing state government and also in public policy in Texas is use these concrete numbers as ways of making clear some of this information that might otherwise be abstract. And I think that the more you can make these sorts of things clear for students, the more they see the, uh, the opportunities uh, for them to in fact actually use this. I sometimes like to take a user's guide approach to uh, how I teach the material, how I teach the constitution and all the rest of this too. This is how it's impacting you. This is, these are also the, this through, you can in fact actually uh, say necessarily make a difference because that kind of sounds kind of uh, hokey in its own sense, but it's not incorrect, but to understand and also see what types of things you can in fact actually do um, to, to impact. Uh, things on the, the local level, the state level. Uh, but it all begins with understanding. It all begins with us, I think, using our platform to be able to specifically show students what is out there, what kind of information they can get, what they can do with this. And that's what's exciting about what we have right here, what we're developing. And it's, it's loose to the point that it's adaptable to the needs of any uh, faculty member who chooses to use it. It's not a static instrument. It's a very dynamic instrument, and I think that something is going to be uh, as good as the information that is going to be provided for it by, uh, by its adopters. And thank you, Brian. Yeah, great. Kevin, thank, thanks so much. Uh, all right, Terry, if you want to jump, jump right in, please. I will. Thank you. Um, I think I don't want to repeat what's already been said, and I want to make sure that we have time for questions, but there's a couple of things that I'll point out. Um, 
I'm out here in West Texas, right at the right angle of Texas, um, and we are primarily a Hispanic serving institution where the majority of my students are first generation to college. So the cost factor is incredibly important for people who are, who are at institutions like mine. Um, I also am just thrilled about the fact that we will be able to update this edition. You know, I was looking at some of the editions of the regular uh, textbooks that are out that by the, the time they are adopted in the fall, they are already going to be um, outdated in a number of ways. And then I think, too, we have to remember 2020 changed the way we deliver higher education. Um, we will never go back to delivering education the way that we did before the pandemic. And students have learned to be flexible. They have learned to be adaptable. And I think that's what makes this type of a textbook so important um, as we move forward um, and allowing them to now embrace all of those tools that in many ways they were forced to adapt to in 2020, but now they're incredibly comfortable with. So I have a couple of chapters in the book. Um, the introduction to Texas really deals with political culture. And I tried to change things up a little bit because I want to make it more relevant to the students rather than just simply using you know, the traditional way of talking about culture. But I really wanted to talk about the different people within the state of Texas, not just Anglo-Americans and Hispanics and African-Americans and the American Indians, but also get a sense of people who are living in poverty, people who are elderly and the issues that they face, um, the religion and how it affects the culture in Texas, our educational system, women um, in Texas politics. So we take it a little bit further and hopefully make it a little bit more meaningful to the students. And then also um, looking in all government, Texas government books, we talk about the physical geographic regions, but I really wanted to focus a little bit more on the politics within those geographic regions. And hopefully in this chapter, set the stage for the, the uh, chapters that will follow. And then my other chapter on local government, I'm really having fun with this one, because once again, this is where most of our students are gonna participate. Very few of them are gonna go to Washington, DC, a few of them may make it to Austin, but most of them are going to be involved right here on the local level. So bringing in those stories, what happened in the cities and the counties during the blizzard of a couple of weeks ago um, when we went through the pandemic and now uh, we're coming out of it and the governor has you know, lifted restrictions. And so now we've got the mayor of Austin and we've got um, the attorney general fighting with each other, we can put those little stories in, those little vignettes in, so that it makes it a little bit more real for those people who are living perhaps down in South Texas and experienced it completely different than maybe the way that we did out here in West Texas. And I think that leaves about five minutes for <laughs> questions, so I'm going to close so that we can take some. Yeah, please do. Yeah, and I think uh, if we can show also our contact information, uh, obviously, just a few minutes for, for questions, but um, please feel free to reach out to us uh, if you, for any follow-up, any, anything that, that you'd like further uh, detail on, um, please, please reach out. So, so yes, uh, questions. Are they in the... Uh, I don't see any questions yet on the chat. Um, okay. All right. It, so we'll we'll just uh, give it a another m moment or so um, for any 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 questions. Um, how, uh, Lindsay Semivolos Semivo asked, how is the material kept up to date? So the folks that we have engaged, uh, so Terry and Kevin are, are two of, of five folks that we are, are working with, um, uh, th they're 
with the materials um, all, um, all the time. So the the content can be updated directly into our platform um, by the the faculty um, authors um, directly. So and it's done in real time. So any any changes that they would make would flow through to the adopted versions. Um, so that's that's the principal way in which uh, materials are kept up to date. Um, but just as as we've described earlier, um, it's also uh, the, the faculty on the ground can make uh, changes to to these materials um, if they'd like to keep uh, insert new, new information um, that might be particularly relevant to the class that they're teaching. So that there there are two ways uh, in which materials are kept up to date, both one by the um, the producers, the authors, and the other um, by the adopters. Uh, but primarily, it's 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 on our side, it's the, uh, um, the producers of that content. Um, do we have Can I add something? Sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. A lot of what we're doing right here is developed bit by bit. So we don't necessarily assume that ahead of time, we have the best idea about how to go forward with something. I think the idea of bringing new people in in terms of adopting the textbook is also bringing your ideas, your innovation in as well, too. And so it may very well be that we have certain ideas about how we want to integrate what other instructors would like to do, what they might like to add. But we may not necessarily have the best idea in, the, uh, in terms of how best to do this. That might be something that uh, someone else uh, who comes in uh, and joins us uh, might provide. So whatever ideas you might have, you know, throw them at us. We're willing to listen to you. Right. Um, and how do the faculty, I'm seeing a question here, how do the fa faculty working at different institutions navigate the intellectual property rights? Is the copyright with the institutions or with the faculty? So um, everything that's published in PanOpen um, is by default a Creative Commons license. It, 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 it's required to be a Creative Commons license. Um, and typically that is retained by, um, it depends on how much work we're involved, but it's it's the authors themselves that retain uh, that, with you, or in a case like this, it would be joint, um, uh, they and us together, but under a Creative Commons license, meaning they or anybody would be free to use that underlying content. Um, so that's how, how we, we, we don't work with commercial copyrights at all. That's how we address that issue. Um, there is a question, uh, what's the biggest challenge in producing a book like this? I will throw this out to Terry and Kevin. <laughs> well, I think for me, at, at, at least for me, um, it, it's just so, tip, so, so different from a standard textbook where the information is so much more generalizable. Um, in this particular type of format, we can use very specific examples. We can use uh, current events. We can bring them in literally as they are happening. So I think it, you know, it puts a responsibility on us, which we should all be doing anyway, to keep very current. And we'll, when we hear about one of those things that just really resonates with us to make sure that we get it incorporated as quickly as we can. For me, I'd say two things. Uh, one is organizing it in such a way that it is gripping. There was a great book a few years ago called Make It Stick, which I think was mostly like a sales thing. How can you present something to someone so that the idea sticks as easily as possible? And I try to, I think about that. And I try to do it when I'm teaching. The other thing, uh, especially since uh, what, what I'm doing with the Constitution and the, uh, the finance, maybe a little bit less so with public uh, policy because that can be a little bit more theory driven, getting the facts right. So I'll write something out and sometimes I'll have to go to two or three different sources just to make sure that I've got all that down because obviously this, that's, that's one place where you don't want to get things wrong. You know, if, if, let's say you, you, you present a conference paper, maybe later on you find out, well, it wasn't quite correct, but there are only four people who showed up and I don't think anybody's actually read it. So um, no harm, no foul, but that's certainly not the case here. But I would say the former thing, making it, organizing it in such a way that it makes sense. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Okay. I can go on. <laughs> I think I think we're probably out of out of time now. So, uh, but there there again is our contact information, and uh, yeah, Michelle, handing it back to you. Thank you so much uh, for this presentation and for answering uh, the questions from the audience. Uh, this has been very enjoyable. And uh, please uh, don't forget to everyone to um, answer the feedback survey that we'll have at the end of the conference. Thank you so much, Kevin, Terry, and Brian. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye.